Okay, good morning, everyone. I believe it's 10 o'clock, so let's start this webinar. Um, I hope you're all keeping well. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I am Robert Bean, Managing Partner at Grimberg & Co. In a year in which there has been much turmoil and uncertainty, we decided to set up Grimberg Wealth Management to be able to provide our clients with wide-ranging financial advice. And we are delighted that you are attending the first Grimberg Wealth Management webinar. Grimberg Wealth Management is our new venture in partnership with independent financial advisors, Lumin Wealth Management. We are joined today by Mike Felton, Lumin's Chief Investment Officer, and Greg Norton Kidd, a financial advisor. The world of savings, investments, insurance, and pensions is complex. So I hope today's webinar will give you an insight into the opportunities available to you and your business as we come to the end of this extraordinary year. I will now pass you over to Greg, there will be a question and answer session at the end, so please feel free to click on the Q&A button to ask any questions. Over to Greg. Many thanks, Robert. And Joe, if we could just flick over to the next slide, please. Uh, we'll just outline some of the topic, topics that Mike and I are going to be covering today. Um, the title of the presentation, Opportunities and Silver Linings, obviously it has been a a crazy year and a, a challenging year for, for most of us. Uh, so Mike and I are going to just highlight some of the opportunities and silver linings that we see, uh, both in terms of uh, investment opportunities in financial markets and also some advice ideas as well. So just to take a very quick look at the, at the menu here, uh, on the we're going to start off on the investments or so to run us through our latest thoughts on markets. Um, and after that, I'll touch on a number of advice ideas. Um, the budget back in March did contain some good news. Seems like a long time ago, um, but there was some quite important news related to pensions in particular that we wanted to highlight. Um, we're also looking at, uh, for, for business owners who, who may be on the call, uh, quite an interesting way of, of lining up additional funding options for your business in these times of uncertainty. Um, and then we're also just going to have a look at a couple of capital gains related things. Obviously, that's quite topical at the moment uh, and being um, discussed in the press with you know, potential rule changes and um, just sharing some of our thoughts and ideas there. Um, so that's what we're hoping to cover today. Um, and it's going to be a relatively short presentation. Uh, I think Mike and I are going to cover the, uh, the, the presentation here probably in you know, 20 minutes or so. Uh, and then we'd be delighted to take questions. Um, so on that, I'll hand over to my colleague, Mike. And Joe, if we could have the next slide, please. Good uh, morning, everyone. Thank you, Greg. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, I think Greg said it's been a, an unusual year. Uh, I think we've had uh, unprecedented use of the word unprecedented uh, and also uncertainty has been up there as well. Uh, if you did a word count on that in the national press, I think you'd find it uh, used fairly regularly. Uh, so I was just going to run through our investment philosophy at uh, Lumen Wealth and also then go on to a couple of investment opportunities uh, that we see at the moment uh, and also one other very interesting feature of the market at the moment. moment. Uh, so uh, on this first slide, we aim to deliver strong returns over the long term by participating in the upside when markets are good and protecting the downside when markets are poor. Uh, we're not aggressive chasers of performance. Our style is very much to build an innings rather than attempt to smack the ball out of the park. We're, in that respect, we're a lot more uh, Alex Cook or Jeffrey Boycott than we are Ian Botham or Ben Stokes. Uh, we invest proactively to where fundamental analysis suggests markets are heading uh, rather than where they've been. Uh, we're not momentum investors uh, and we invest by looking through the windscreen rather than looking through the rear view mirror. Uh, and we finally would rather be early to uh, a change in investment theme rather than being late and heading for the exit door the same time as everyone else when someone shouts fire in a crowded cinema. 
In terms of uh, the next point consistent with this aim, our investment philo philosophy has two fundamental, fun fundamental beliefs. Uh, portfolios need to be diversified and investment needs to be long term. So diversification is simply the process of spreading your investment, not putting all your assets, uh, all your eggs into the one basket. Um, interestingly, studies show that uh, a typical balance sort of 50 50 portfolio of equities and bonds captures the vast majority of the returns to an equities only portfolio over time, but with substantially less volatility and uh, maximum drawdown, which is the peaked trough move at any one stage. Excuse me, my phone's just going off. Let me just turn that off. Um, getting a phone call from the office, interestingly. Uh, um, and also just bearing in mind when it, we're talking about diversification, that asset classes over many years perform very differently. So the asset class of choice over the, over the 2010s has been uh, Wall Street, has been the US equity market. Uh, US equity market was just about the weakest of the major asset classes during the noughties. Uh, so that's um, another good reason for having diversification. In terms of long-term um, asset prices are volatile, they go up and they go down, but generally over time, uh, they head uh, in the same way that the economic, uh, economic growth does uh, in a sort of upward sloping trend. Um, and the best returns over the long term are those uh, who stay in the market and don't try and time their entry and entries or exit. It's all about time in the market rather than timing. Um, and the reason for this is that often the very best days come after the very worst days. Uh, so whilst you may look clever one day, you look very stupid the next day. And we've seen that just recently in markets. Uh, we've had some you know, very, very strong performances in areas that previously have been really rather weak. We'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, and our investment proposition is clean and simple. Um, we offer five model portfolios, each populated by between 15 and 20 best in class underlying funds, um, both active and passive. Passive is our sort of default option, low cost entry, but active when we think uh, real value can be added. Next slide, please. So, uh, as I said, just uh, mentioning briefly two attractive investment opportunities that we see at the moment. The first one, um, somewhat bizarrely, may surprise you to hear this, is, uh, is the UK. Um, but that's the point in a way. Uh, it is perhaps a surprise because there appears to be plenty of reasons not to like the UK. Uh, foremost amongst them Brexit uh, and of course our perhaps somewhat poor handling of, of the coronavirus uh, um, issue. But uh, you see from this chart uh, that a lot of that is already in the price and you will see how we have underperformed. So uh, the UK is the blue line C on the chart there. The green line in the middle is a world index. Uh, so um, a combination of uh, stock markets from around the world, and A is the US market. And uh, we have materially underperformed since the global financial crisis. Uh, so from April uh, 2009 there, um, both the world and the US index and the jaws of underperformance have sort of opened out uh, since the start of 2016. Uh, and the start of 2016 was when David Cameron first uh, declared or, or said that we would have a referendum on Europe. And you can kind of like see why this is the case, uh, that we are uh, both unloved, underowned, and and undervalued. So if you're an international investor sitting in uh, New York or Singapore or um, Tokyo, uh, and you're thinking about investing around the world, it's a very brave investor who would uh, invest in the UK. You don't have to, it's not such a big market uh, when Brexit hangs, hangs over um, the country. Uh, so that means we've been very unloved. Uh, there's a great uh, fund manager survey that comes out monthly from um, one of the big broking houses. 
and uh, regularly the UK is the most unloved asset class when fund managers from around the world are asked to name. Uh, we're under owned, so uh, these international managers have been voting with their feet. They've been selling the UK equity class, um, and we've seen massive flows out of the UK market uh, over recent years. For the past five years, big, big flows out of the market, uh, meaning that supply is outstripped demand, and we know what happens to prices when that occurs. Uh, and this has led us to be very undervalued relative to other uh, global markets. So on virtually any measure that you would care to choose, whether it's basic PE, price earnings, price to book, price to sales, uh, price to cash flow, the UK looks an attractive market. Um, we've had the uncertainty, we've had this huge uncertainty, but some of it is clearing up. Um, the vaccine news is very good. Brexit, uh, we should get some sort of answer within the next few weeks. And even even it's a no deal, what uh, investors hate more than anything is uncertainty. It's a bit like when you're waiting for the Thames train at the station. Any information over the tannoy is good rather than just standing there and not knowing what's going on. So we think the UK is attractive. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, the second investment opportunity we'd like to point out at the stage is uh, the opportunity of, um, presented by uh, investing in value uh, areas rather than growth areas. So value, uh, typically, those stocks with low valuations, uh, regular income, uh, they provide a yield, um, they have lots of real assets. Um, on the growth side, more uh, very high valuations, generally no yield or very low yield, uh, and uh, not much by way of real assets. They have intangible rather than real assets. And ever since the global financial crisis in 2009, we've seen uh, growth massively outperform value as an investment style, as you can see from the chart there. It's the longest period that growth has uh, outperformed outperformed value uh, since the 1930s, since the Great Depression. Um, reasons for this, so uh, the recovery from the global financial crisis has been very anemic, it's been very weak. Um, so investors have been happy to pay a premium for what little growth there is around. Uh, interest rates have been very low since the global financial crisis. So um, the risk premium, uh, investors have been happy to pay more for future earnings uh, rather than here, near, here and present, near and present earnings. So um, growth stocks that um, advertise or, or promise uh, great rewards looking out 30 years uh, have been more highly vi uh, valued than, than previously because of uh, the equity risk premium. Uh, we think there's a great opportunity here um, and if you combine the two, and if you get a, a UK value uh, fund, uh, of which there are a few really good ones, then that makes an awful lot of sense. Now, I have to say, uh, that since we put these charts together um, and the vaccine news at the start of the month, um, so three vaccines on the last three Mondays have been announced, it's changed things quite a lot. Um, and uh, the UK has, um, has performed nicely in very short period, but in the last three weeks, it's up about 17%. Um, and a UK value fund that we own and GLG during this period is up about 26%. Uh, and this sort of makes the point about being in the market. It's time in the market rather than timing. There's no way you would have been able to time that. So you had to be present in the market. Uh, final slide from me, please. Uh, on the other hand, and th this is fascinating, this is uh, some sort of um, example of mania, I think, uh, and this is Tesla. Uh, Tesla has been an unbelievable stock this year. It's up sixfold. Uh, it's in the news quite a bit this morning. Um, I noticed that uh, Elon Musk, who's chief executive of Tesla, is now the second richest man in the world after Jeff Bezos. Um, performance has been incredible. 
Um, it is obviously the uh, electric vehicle, the electric car, but also solar systems uh, and SpaceX, but neither of those latter two produce any um, uh, profits at the moment. So it's all down to the car. Um, the car is uh, at the vanguard of movements here, but it, uh, Tesla's only got around about a half a percent of global car projection at the moment. And yet the valuation of Tesla uh, is greater than all the other car companies throughout the world put together uh, by a comfortable margin now. Uh, so I think Tesla produce, uh, let me remind myself, um, they produce, uh, they've got 25 billion of uh, sales for their cars versus uh, 520 billion of sales for um, uh, uh, General Motors and Ford put together. Um, but it, uh, it doesn't seem to matter. The, the, the uh, market's got hugely excited about this stock. It's not behaving in a rational fashion. Um, it's doing fantastically well, um, but um, we would be more inclined to be following the fundamentals rather than the sentiment. Uh, and we think that this is a classic example of market mania. And uh, whilst it will perform well over future years, it may be that today we're looking at the highest valuation this company will get for many years to come. Uh, on that, I'll pass uh, back to Greg. Thanks, Mike. And Joe, if we can have the next slide, please. Um, OK, so thanks, Mike, for a quick run through uh, our market views. Now, just looking at uh, a few ideas quickly on the advice side. Um, the first one here is a little windfall from Rishi Sunak in the budget back in March. And with it being a bit of a crazy year for so many reasons, um, this does seem to be something that um, may have slipped through the net and people may have missed. Um, so one of the many things announced in the spring budget was a change in the rules around pension contributions. Um, and for those earning uh, higher amounts of money, over £150,000 a year, uh, there was a significant increase in the amount of money that you're allowed to pay into your uh, pension each year. Um, so there's a little chart there sort of illustrating how it affects different people at different um, earnings levels. Um, but uh, a lot of people um, in that earning, in, in that sort of income range, uh, will be able to pay substantially more money into their pension than they could last year and the year before and the year before. Uh, and you're, you're probably aware of the fact that, you know, pension contributions are a very tax efficient way um, uh, to save for retirement because those, that money is going into your pension on a pre-tax basis rather than uh, the tax man taking a slice of it. So if we look at the sort of the sweet spot, uh, there will be individuals that are able to pay an additional or extra £30,000 into their pension this year versus last year. Um, and because of these income levels, um, anyone in that situation is also automatically an additional rate taxpayer. Um, so you get tax relief on your pension contributions and as an additional rate taxpayer, that tax relief is actually 45%. So uh, you may be able to pay an extra £30,000 into your pension. And if you can, that's nice in itself, but getting 45% tax relief on that is a, uh, is a very generous windfall from Rishi Sunak. So a little bit of uh, good news there from the budget that some may have missed. And the, um, you know, the sort of simple 10 second summary of this slide is that anyone earning over £150,000 a year needs to review their pension contributions because making the same contribution you made last year is almost certainly going to be wrong. Uh, next slide, please, Joe. Um, this is a slightly different look at pensions from a, a very different angle. Um, so SAS is a type of pension scheme normally targeted at uh, company directors. Um, they've been around for a long time. It's SAS stands for Small Self-Administered Scheme. 
Uh, and in many ways, they're very similar to other forms of pensions uh, in terms of the rules and the tax efficiency and the efficient ways to save for retirement. That's all the same. Um, but because they are targeted at company directors or partners, business partners, uh, you're given some additional flexibilities uh, in terms of investments that you don't have with a plain vanilla pension. Uh, and there's a couple of things to touch on here that may be useful, particularly in these uncertain times. Um, so one of the things that you can do with a SAS pension is you can actually lend half of the value of your pension back to your business. Now, that, that may be something that is useful, that may be something that is not useful, but in times of uncertainty, when you don't quite know how friendly the bank manager is going to be next year or the year after, having an additional uh, funding source or ace up your sleeve, should you need it, um, is quite an interesting angle and an additional feature of a SAS pension that is not available with other pension structures. So for business owners that like having as much flexibility as possible on the funding side, that's quite an interesting extra op option. <clears throat> um, second feature with SAS pensions is that it's quite easy to hold commercial property inside a SAS pension. So for example, if you have a business um, that, that owns commercial property, uh, it is possible for um, the pension to purchase that property off the business. So um, pension buys the property from the business, business receives cash from the pension, and then the property is leased back again. Um, and as well as being an efficient mechanism for extracting property out of a business, which sometimes people want to do, um, it's also effectively another way of injecting cash into the business um, if you need to do that at some point in the future. So nothing has changed here in terms of the rules around SASs. They've, they've been around for a long time. Uh, what has changed is that we're in quite an uncertain business environment, and that is probably going to be the case uh, for another couple of years or so. Next slide, please, Joe. OK, just jumping around a little bit um, with markets having been pretty volatile this year, as, uh, as Mike was describing. Uh, one of the consequences of that is that um, for anybody with investment portfolios, uh, it's been a, a pretty complicated year in terms of investment gains, investment losses and what um, some of the tax implications there may be. Um, so <clears throat> with you know, some markets performing poorly and, you know, the UK until recently has been a good example of that. Uh, people may be sitting on investment losses. Uh, you know, nobody likes to see the value of investments go down, of course. Um, but we're just highlighting uh, a bit of a silver lighting, lining uh, for people that find themselves in that scenario. So just starting on the sort of left hand column of this slide, we're imagining um, we own an investment that we purchased for £30,000. Unfortunately, it's gone down. Now it's only worth £20,000 and we're sitting on a loss um, of £10,000. Um, if we realise that loss, um, those investment losses can be carried forward to future years or can offset gains um, in the current year uh, as a shield to capital gains tax. So although there's a loss there, there is a value to crystallizing that loss because it does provide a shelter from uh, CGT. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is, if we were to take the proceeds from that uh, investment sale, £20,000, um, and put them, that money into an ISA, so ISAs, tax efficient, tax free saving vehicles, uh, money in an ISA grows free of capital gains and also income tax. So if we fast forward um, a few years, let's say markets improve and rebound and things go back to where they started. Um, if that £20,000 investment rebounds, um, that investment is now held inside the ISA in a tax-free environment. So in a few years time, we might possibly have a 
£10,000 gain on the investment. Could even be the same investment as the one we just sold. Um, but the nuance here is that our losses from the initial sale are tax deductible, whereas the gains inside the ISA are not taxable. So it's a little bit of having your cake and eat it by taking advantage of the tax benefits of an ISA whilst also getting the tax benefits of, um, uh, of crystallizing losses. And last slide, please, Joe. So also uh, looking at volatile markets and uh, asset prices and uh, capital taxes uh, from a slightly different angle, um, in this example, we imagine we own an asset. It, it, could be, it could be a house, it could be an investment portfolio. And at the start of the year, it was valued at £100,000. And now, unfortunately, uh, it's gone down and it's valued at £70,000. Um, now, of course, nobody likes to see the value of investments decline. Um, but for anybody who is considering gifting, uh, and possibly thinking about or starting to think about passing things on to uh, children, grandchildren, etc. This is quite a good time to be thinking about that. And this slide just runs through some of the numbers there. So uh, what some people are not aware of is that unfortunately on making gifts, even though you're giving the assets away, um, there often are capital gains and inheritance tax consequences of doing that. And in this case, we're looking at CGT, capital gains tax. And you can see down the bottom of the slide, if we'd given this asset away in January, then with the, the, the gains that we had on that disposal, we would have been looking at a capital gains bill of just over £6,000 if it was investments or just over £9,000 if it was a house. So higher rate of tax on residential property. If we're giving the asset away now at lower prices, you can see down the bottom, you know, unfortunately the value of the asset has gone down, um, but so have the taxes. So in this case, the asset has fallen by about 30%. Um, the tax bill has fallen by about 90%. So still some tax to pay, but a much, much, much smaller sum than uh, was the case back at the start of the year um, we're at, at higher prices. <clears throat> so that's just a, a couple of ideas there related to uh, capital gains tax. Obviously that's a little bit topical at the moment with uh, the latest review that's just been floated from the Office of Tax Simplification, a couple of ideas around pensions, and I think we'll wrap it up there and see if anyone has questions. Brilliant. Thank you so much, both of you, for that very informative presentation. I hope everyone found it useful. Um, there have been a couple of questions that have been asked prior to um, the webinar starting, so I'll just um, ask those. You mentioned about capital gains tax changes um, in the simplification of tax. Do you have any views on that or any thoughts on that that you'd like to um, discuss? Thanks, Robert. I might take that one. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, um, it, it's about two weeks since the Office of Tax Simplification published their monster report of suggestions and proposals of things that may, may happen uh, to capital gains tax. And the, the short answer is, is nothing is decided and, and nobody knows with certainty um, exactly what's going to happen. That's the honest answer. Um, but there are a few observations that we can make. Um, uh, the first of which is that the whole purpose of the review is you know, looking for ways for the government to try to raise tax revenue to pay for the enormous costs of um, uh, the virus and the, and the furlough schemes this year. Um, so I think we can say with, let's say, 99% certainty uh, that capital gains tax rates will not be going down. <laughs> Um, they might go up, they might be unchanged, they might do something on the uh, annual exemptions, but they're almost definitely not going to be going down. Um, so that's a, that's a statement we're reasonably comfortable with. Um, if we assume that 
the rules are going to be tightened or rates are going to be raised or allowances are going to be reduced in some way, uh, what we can say is that in that environment, the attraction of uh, tax-free vehicles like pensions and ISAs should be even greater in the future than it has been up until now. So um, yeah, the, 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 the more unfavorable uh, the capital gains tax rates are, the greater the value in, in moving uh, savings into a, um, into a tax-free structure. So um, perhaps a good time to be taking a good look at exactly what your pension and ISA allowances are and whether you've been um, taking full advantage of those or whether there's, uh, or whether there's more that can be done. Um, so that would be uh, one observation, but you know, we, uh, we don't have a crystal ball, unfortunately, as to exactly what the rule changes may be. Okay, thank you. Um, and there's one question on pensions. Um, if you have multiple pension pots, is it wise to consolidate them? Uh, I think uh, I better take that one as well, uh, Robert. Thank you. Um, Yes, so that's a very good question as well. Um, so pension consolidation is something that um, we do an awful lot of. And um, it's a good thing to do really just for the simplicity of just making life a little bit easier and, um, and, and the admin uh, more straightforward. Um, and it's very, very common for um, clients to come to us and, and be consolidating, you know, possibly three, four, five legacy pensions. And sometimes it's almost comical. You know, people have literally just found an envelope down the back of the sofa and a pension they've forgotten they've had. And um, uh, just to have everything consolidated in one place uh, does tend to make life a lot more straightforward. Um, what it also allows us to do uh, is make sure that the investments within those pensions or the new pension people are setting up um, are suitable um, and appropriate for that person at, at this sort of age and stage of their life and their retirement planning objectives. And what we quite often find is people may have legacy pensions and you know they sort of haven't even opened the envelopes for 10 years and the pension and the investment that might have been perfect for you 10 years ago may not be um, you know, suitable today just because circumstances change. So there's certainly um, uh, an advantage in terms of making sure that your pension is sort of fit for purpose and doing what it's supposed to do. And there's significant, significant uh, just administrative ease in having everything in uh, in one spot as well. Thank you. Um, I think that's it for questions now. So thank you again to Greg and Mike for your presentation. Thank you for everyone attending. I think this will be available on social media and our websites to rewatch again. Um, and everyone have a good day and rest of the year and keep safe and well. Thank you for watching. Thank you.